What is up guys? Welcome back to another review video, this time featuring the most potent minis money can buy. Now, so much power in fact that it has finally tempted YB Huffer Shah, the man himself, to come out from his air-conditioned cave. And because I'm feeling nice, I'm gonna let you pick your weapon of choice. Uh, okay, if that's how you wanna play it, I'm gonna choose the one that I know. He prefers the Clubman JCW. Ah, shit. <laughs> Fine then. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to the most powerful and expensive minis on sale in Malaysia. Roll the intro. Let's go. Let's go. Bro, let me the jacket. Hey, bro, it's so freaking hot, dude. It's like 200 degrees out here. It's a mini. Dude, panas lah. Kau dengan Jilly sama. Apa ha? Kurang ah. Panas, doh. On my left is the John Cooper Works Clubman, which is priced at 359,000 ringgit, and the bulbous crossover next to it, the John Cooper Works Countryman, is the most expensive mini on sale, priced at 379,000 ringgit. These two sit on a larger UKL2 platform in the BMW Mini range, which means they are the more practical mini models compared to the five-door hatch. That's a much smaller car and sits on the subcompact UKL platform and honestly shouldn't even exist in my opinion. Okay, on to design and let's start with Countryman. Visually, it's pretty much the same as before and it gets the whole JCW treatment, so red highlights all over and large intakes here for the uh, extra radiators. So, moving over to the JCW, Clubman, this is actually based on the facelift, so you get the whole visual update as well, starting with the full LED circle, daytime running lights, as well as this oblong shaped um, LED headlights. The grille is unique to the JCW model. It has this honeycomb pattern with red inserts across the board, and this vent is unfortunately fake. At the bottom, you don't get LED fog lights, so it's again, basically the same JCW treatment, so big air intakes for the intercoolers. Around the sides, both cars get the same 19-inch alloy wheels which look great and behind them are massive four-port brakes. Like Matt said, the Countryman is not based on a facelift, it's based on the existing car. So you're saddled with the old-style halogen bulb tail lamps, not LED, not cool, although the rear bumper is slightly different now with slightly bigger twin tailpipe. As for the Clubman, this is based on the new facelift, so you do get this fully LED tail lamps with this Union Jack design. I'm not a big fan of this, but at least it looks distinctive. And fun fact, the brake lights are now finally up here instead of being down there in the old car, which I thought was a bit weird. Moving on, there's a unique JCW rear bumper down there, and interestingly enough, the rear exhausts are even bigger than the ones on the Countryman. And yes, they do sound pretty good. And while we're talking about designs, I'll just say this. If you're looking for a mini family car, these are the two models that you should consider, not the five-door mini. I think proportionally that car is all kinds of wrong, and it's not even that spacious to begin with. Buying a mini is all about being fashionable, right? And that car is anything but that. Okay, over to boot space, the Countryman gets the larger boot space here. Of course, it comes with a power tailgate, very nice touch. And this is 450 liters of space, complete with an underfloor storage. If you don't, you wanna haul more stuff. And for those of you who like to hang around the back of your car and just talk about, I don't know, lifestyle, stylish, whatever stuff, you get to sit on this. It's a padded bench. And you know, it's not gonna scuff up your rear bumper, which is a nice touch. And now for the Clubman, well, if you like all kinds of strange and you like Jonathan Lee, this is gonna tickle your fancy. So it's got six doors, as you can see, and four wipers, which is a rare thing to say in cars. And it opens like this, only one way to open it. It is not powered, it's got a pneumatic strut over there, and that's about it. Boot space is 360 liters and also comes with an underfloor compartment, but it's not as deep as the Countryman. And like I mentioned earlier, it's not powered, so you've got to manually close two doors, which is extra work. Uh, but I guess... Whatever. One last thing before we move on, this unique barn door style rear hatch does look cool and it is a novel idea, 
but it does bring about quite a few issues beyond just the simple act of opening and closing them. Number one is this center pillar over here. It does restrict your rear view mirror when you're driving and it gets especially bad at night and when it's raining. Because of the way the rear windscreen is placed, you cannot imagine how much water and gunk this thing attracts. And worse yet, these tiny wipers, they don't do much at all. The only reason they've done this is because there was a classic old me that had the same barn door style rear hatch. But no, that one was not called the Clubman, that was called the Traveller. The classic Clubman was just a regular small mini with a boxy face, but I guess the Germans thought we've all forgotten about that. And while we're talking about these silly names, I think it's about time Mini stop using all this funky clubman, countryman, paceman, whatever. Every time I say that, people ask me back, like, which one is that again? Is that the small one? Is that the big one? The long one? I don't know. I think they just go simple. Three door, five door, SUV, crossover, whatever. This one, why don't you call it the Mini Estate? Well, okay, maybe not the estate because that has a bit of a negative connotation in Malaysia. How about Mini 6 door? Inside, again, not much changes to the JCW compared to the previous generation, but there are new stuff, starting with this, the instrument cluster complete with the new uh, fuel gauge design as well as a JCW badge down below. And over here in the center console, you've got a new iDrive system as well as the oblong shaped electronic gear lever. The uh, seats are also new, it's got a new color and uh, pattern, um, but it's not as sporty as the one before. And it also is fully manual, which I don't mind at all. And it comes with this lumbar adjuster, so not bad, quite like that. Design-wise, the status stack still gets the same 8.8-inch touchscreen head unit from before, but it's upgraded and it uses BMW's reskin version of its in-car entertainment system. This is actually one of the easiest in-car operating systems to use and the colours just make it a little bit more fun, you know, adds a little bit to the whole experience. It also gets a new 4G SIM function and new mini connected app and the wireless Apple CarPlay system doesn't lag as bad as the older head unit, so all good. Speaking of wireless, there is also a new wireless charging tray but it's built into the uh, first tier of the armrest tier. But if you've got like, I'm using an iPhone 8 Plus with a slightly thin casing and for some reason it doesn't, it doesn't fit into this cradle over here. But uh, if you have a phone that does fit, it has an LED light here that lights up in blue to let you know that it's charged. Um, if you want wired connection, you've got three fast charging USB-C ports, so make sure you have the right adapters or the right cables for them. You've got one in here in the center console as well as two at the back, which is nice. Other than that, it still has the same 12 color ambient lighting, which cycles between each color very smoothly and very nice. I, I think it's a party piece in this car. And it's got the uh, 12 speaker Harman Kardon sound system. It's got a 360 watt digital amplifier. But to be honest with you, it doesn't sound all that great. And then we move on to the Clubman's interior, which is very similar as you can see to the Countryman's, but there are stark differences as well. The Countryman is more vertically aligned, there's a lot more vertical elements in the interior to make it look taller, befitting of an SUV, whereas this is more horizontal, there's a lot more longer lines to stretch out the interior, accentuate this car's width a bit more. I think it's a very nice touch to differentiate the two cars even though most of the parts are shared between the two. One key difference is the way these cars use ambient lighting whereas the Countryman has lights all around the dash. The Clubman is a bit more subdued, there's the same ring over here but there's no light on the dashboard, just on the door cards. I think at night it's the Countryman that stands out a lot more. In terms of build quality, it's the usual mini affair. That is to say, most of the touch points are very, very good. It's a solid premium quality feel in this car. I say for the most part because some of the wheels are a little bit loose. Yeah, not so great. But on the whole, this is a better interior compared to the likes of the A-Class and the B-Class and definitely a huge leap compared to the aging GLA. The one thing where these cars lag behind the Mercedes is, is in terms of ambient lighting, which is a bit of a pity because Mini was the very first brand that started this whole LED color lighting interior thing way back like 10 years ago. It's just that since then, Mercedes has grabbed that idea and completely ran away with it. 
Mini is now left with this 12 color combination which is still very good but it's just not quite as elaborate or as eye-catching as what's on the latest Mercedes. But strictly between these two Minis, it's the Countryman's interior which I prefer because this car just looks a little bit dark whereas the Countryman has a bit more chrome work, it feels and looks a little bit more premium. Now on to the things that I don't really like. Number one, this head unit. It's a cheaper kind of head unit where it projects onto this plastic screen instead of going straight on to the windscreen. That's a bit meh. And then there's no power seats for this car. These are very expensive premium cars, of course. I know Matt said he doesn't really mind it, but yeah, no, no, please don't. Because if you use this car, you drop it off at the valet and the seats when you come back are all in a different position. You can't just press a button to move it back in your ideal sitting position. That is just nonsense. Moving on, the sunroof, which is fine. Well, not really because we live in Malaysia and it's really, really hot. But anyway, the biggest offender is this manual sunshade. Yeah, not very premium, is it? But even worse than that is the rear sunshade because it's a completely different piece. So if someone in the back have left it open and then you're later driving alone, I can't reach there to close it. You gotta stop the car, go to the back and close it separately. Yeah, that's a no-no. And then you move on to the reverse camera. That's right, there's only a reverse camera, not an all-around view camera for this car. But worse yet, on the Clubman, the camera is placed so low, you can't really see the lines where you're supposed to park. So you may end up parking, you know, a bit off the line, a little bit. But in any case, one more complaint. Last one, I promise. There is no sunglass holder for this car. There's no dedicated place where you can store your sunglasses. It's as if many things, its owners prefer to use them indoors. Maybe, I don't know, is that a thing now? But don't worry, I'm not just bitching about this car on purpose. There are a lot of good parts too. Number one, Apple CarPlay working wirelessly is absolutely fantastic. I cannot for the life of me consider going back to a wired setup that just feels so old school nowadays. But, oh, yeah, one more complaint, sorry. The screen, even though it's a big white screen, the CarPlay section only takes up a small portion of the car. It's sort of a bit of a waste of space, if you ask me. But, moving on, another good thing. This car has auto high beam, which is one better compared to the Countryman. On Malaysia's many, many, many unlit roads, this is a godsend. Okay, so being the largest Mini, the back seat is actually pretty decent. You've got enough leg room and knee room to move around so you don't feel constrained on long distance drives. But um, one thing to note is that the door aperture doesn't open quite well. So it's about there. But having said that, it is still miles better compared to what you get in the Mini Hatch 5 door, which again, I think shouldn't exist because it's super impractical. The rear door is small, the windows don't go all the way down, and the rear seats are super tight. But honestly speaking, this guy, when push comes to shove, you can fit five adults in here. It's going to be a bit tight. But other than that, I think it's a perfectly usable space. Seat back is a bit upright, but on long distance drive, it's okay because the padding is good. And uh, other amenities include this really nice manual sunroof, as well as rear aircon vents. None here in the B pillar, but that's what you get. A bit low, but that's what you get. Now in the back seat of the Clubman, it's actually a slightly better story. So you've got better legroom space and the seat back is not so upright. So it's technically a more comfortable place to be in. Um, although I think the width is more or less the same as the Countryman. Uh, one thing to note, again, the doors, they don't quite open all the way out, but this is a slightly better aperture compared to the Countryman. So overall, in terms of uh, passenger comfort, especially rear passenger comfort, I think the Countryman is a little less compared to the Clubman, if you know what I mean. Okay, so the biggest news here is of course the new engine under the bonnet. Now the JCW models share the same 2 litre, uh, it's the B48 2 litre 4 cylinder engine, turbocharged to make 306 PS and 450 Nm of torque. How does it feel like? 
incredibly rapid, okay? So this is the most powerful B48 tune that you're gonna get, at least for now, BMW says. In comparison, this new engine is about 75 PS and 100 Newton meters more than the older JCW Countryman. And the difference really is quite astounding, guys. The zero to 100 in the old car is about 6.6 .6 seconds. In this guy, already doing almost 100 now, is 5.1 seconds. And really, it gets up to speed, no sweat. The turn of speed is super rapid and it's almost unbelievable how fun this engine really is. Oh, also, for those of you who are wondering, yes, this is the exact same engine that you find in the BMW M135i, the X2 M35i, and the newly launched super hot mini John Cooper Works GP. The Clubman JCW is the exact same engine as the other car, so 306 horsepower on tap, 0 to 100 is even faster at 4.9 seconds because this is lighter this is lower to the ground compared to the countryman it's even quicker than the mini gp the carbon fiber duct car that was just launched recently because that is only front wheel drive whereas this is all wheel drive so what you're looking at is the fastest accelerating mini ever and this engine, it's not just a simple ECU reflash to make it so much more powerful than a standard car. This has a bigger turbocharger, this has better cooling, this has extra radiators and reinforced internals of the engine. So it's not like you can go to a mini showroom and say, hey, I want this much more power, can you do it for me please? No, this goes way beyond that, this has a lot of proper mechanical upgrades as well. Remember, BMW needed a 3.0-litre twin-turbo inline-6 engine just a few years ago to make as much as 306 horsepower. Now we have it in a 2.0-litre turbo 4 and because it's small, we can have it in a tiny mini. Now that's progress. Another upgrade these two cars get is the upgraded exhaust system. Like Hafiz mentioned earlier, the exhaust pipes are now larger, but it also has a bit of pops and crackles to go with it. So the exhaust overruns are a little bit more pronounced and dramatic than before, but again, not as dramatic as you would like, as maybe in the Mercedes AMG model. So this guy, a little bit more subdued, but I like it all the same. So it parts a bit on the upshifts and on the downshifts, and when you're in sport mode, this part of the exhaust system really becomes enjoyable. So on spirited drives, it's definitely gonna put a smile on your face in more ways than one. There's also this synthesized or fake engine noise that gets piped into the cabin and I find it to be directionally targeted towards me or the driver, for example, because when I sit behind as a passenger, it doesn't seem so intense. The sound is not as loud and it's definitely not as amplified. This is a neat trick and I personally enjoy it and if you flick it into sport mode, the sound intensifies even more. But some people may not like it because of uh, its nauseating factor. It's got a deep bassy note that some people are just not able to live with. And really the only way for you to do without the exhaust note is to switch the car into eco, otherwise known as green mode in a minute. Speaking of which, in green mode, the car takes upon a more retarded state. And I mean that in a good way because um, the car becomes a little bit less reactive to sudden throttle inputs like, you know, the irregularities that make car uh, fuel consumption go up. Uh, this eliminates that factor. So whenever you press the pedal a little bit, it doesn't like lunge forward as you would expect a car to have. So in that sense, it retards the throttle response and it also has a coasting feature which decouples the torque converter from the engine. If you're particular about fuel consumption, then you're gonna have to rely on the green mode for the most part because I regularly manage about 13 to 14 liters per 100 kilometers, which is pretty mad for a car like this. But again, a car like this has 300 horsepower and I think 13 to 14 liters per 100 kilometer is pretty okay on mixed driving conditions. Fuel is cheap, Malaysians are rich, I mean people who can afford to buy this car, huh? So what is there to complain about guys, really? Now, if you're gentle on the throttle, you can average around 10 litres per 100 kilometres, but where's the fun in that? 
like Matt said, if you drive it as a normal JCW should be driven, you're looking at 13 to 14 liters per 100 kilometers day in and day out. As for the transmission, this car only has one option now, an 8-speed automatic driving all four wheels from Isin. There's no more manuals, not in Malaysia, not anywhere else in the world. But just drive this car for five minutes and you won't miss the manual all that much because this gearbox is beautiful. The gear shifts are just so smooth so quick and the downshift so precise that you will not be wishing for a do-it-yourself transmission. I don't even use the pedal shift as much as much as say Matt does and it's fine I just leave it in D or Sport or whatever and it does it all for me. It's almost as good as snappy as a Volkswagen DSG twin clutch gearboxes and it's miles better than whatever gearboxes AMG's use in the A45 and the CLA45 and whatsoever. This car makes that car's gearbox feel like a joke. If there's one complaint about this car's gearbox, it's the low speed response. It just feels a little bit hesitant, like say you're coming off a junction like this and there's a car coming and you need to go fast now, 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 now. But yeah, the car has that a little bit of a lag before it decides to go. This is more on the transmission because the engine revs up and down very smoothly, very quickly. So yeah, maybe they can do a little bit of a fine tuning in terms of the transmission, but it's 95% there. In terms of handling, both the largest Mini models in the lineup feel as Mini as they come and that is good news. It still feels very zippy in the corners, like super dirty. And you've got all four Minis, all four all-wheel drive to make use of the uh, traction. To be honest, I think few cars, few mainstream cars in the world feel this special behind the wheel. And Mini should be proud of this because they stuck to its core DNA and uh, I, like, I like the way Mini drives really. The car reacts very quickly to your steering inputs but you know when you're driving long distances it's not as tiring to drive because there's a little bit of deadness off center so that's nice that said despite feeling tight and agile there is still a little bit of body roll to be had in both cars and that is due to weight and center of gravity but overall i think it is generally well controlled so long as you don't overstep the laws of physics i.e speeding into a corner that is a terrible way to drive but other than that i think it's got vast reserves of grip more than a casual enthusiast would need in everyday driving also comparatively between the clubman and the countryman jcw the clubman has a flatter cornering characteristic and that's because you know center of gravity so it's more darty it's a little bit more composed at higher speeds but the threshold really is very marginal so as far as handling goes they are pretty much equal but the clubman is slightly better this helps though with adaptive dampers in sport mode but overall there you have it Moving on to braking, this car has a rather weird braking feel. It's overly grippy at the top end of the pedal travel and as you go down, it goes a little bit mushy as if this car is under braked. That is definitely not the case, not with the new 4 port calipers, but it just feels a little bit off, which is odd for a BMW engineered cars. BMW cars usually have a very fine dynamic polish on them. On this one, it's just a little bit off in terms of the braking feel. There's nothing wrong with the braking power itself. This car will stop on a dime. But when you push this car hard, you may feel that you, know, you want a little bit more feel when it comes to the brake pedal. And then we get to the hard parts, which is the ride comfort. Yeah, this car is not a very comfortable car. I mean, minis are known to be extremely stiff, have a skateboard ride and everything, but these are the bigger mini cars, the Clubman and the Countryman, are usually slightly softer, much more habitable compared to a regular mini. But the JCW brings it back to what you think a mini is, or rather was. It's extremely stiff, 
and on the Clubman it has the basic sport suspension which is 10 millimeters lower than a standard car and it's non-adjustable only the countryman here gets the optional adaptive dampers lumped in together with the price so on this car it's just very jumpy it's very bouncy all over the place it's an extremely busy ride for you to use it as a family car it's a bit of a tough ask i think especially if you have small kids sitting in the back when you're driving alone it's fantastic it's fine it's perfect even but when you've got family in the car family in the back especially they'll be complaining a lot but of course it's all relative so in terms of comfort this is still more comfortable than those ridiculously stiff amg A45s and CLA45s. So if you're coming from that, if that is your benchmark, this will feel plush even. The Countryman rides a lot taller with a lot more suspension travel. It also has thicker tires. It has adaptive dampers. So in comfort mode, it is a lot more pliant. Moving on to refinement. Well, as you can see, you hear a lot of things in this car in a way that sort of makes you more together with the car you feel more of the car you are more in tune with the driving experience you're not detached from it right but yeah on the face of it you do hear a lot of things this is a very loud car you hear a lot from the engine the tires especially you, there's a lot of raw coming from them which again is surprising because both of these cars run on touring tires not ultra high performance tires but even then you hear them at pretty much all speeds and highways and the back roads especially on pockmark roads and this car running on such big wheels and tin tires you drive it along at low speeds around Bangsa where the roads are terrible. Yeah, you're in for a bit of a pain. As for long distance cruising, between the two, again, is the Countryman that is far more comfortable. It's not just the suspension, it's also the driving position because this is a much lower car. The Clubman, you also sit much lower down. Your legs are much straighter and it does put a little bit more stress on your knees. Driving this car for the past two or three days, I feel myself thinking, yeah, I'm getting a bit old for these kind of cars. I'd much rather be driving the Countryman. One last thing to note is the wind noise. Minis traditionally have very upright windscreens and these two cars are no different. So once you go above 140, 150, there's a lot of wind rustling going around the front windscreen and especially the front wing mirrors. And beyond that, you also hear a lot of the tire roar. And if it's raining, there's a lot of noise coming from the sunroof as well. So if you're wishing to be isolated from the outside, this is not the car for you but if you want to feel one with the car one with the road yeah you get a jcw before we end let's just one more thing which is safety or rather the lack thereof yes i mean for the asking price that they both command it doesn't even go beyond the usual stuff like um six airbags but you know where are stuff like autonomous emergency braking, lane keeping assist, blind spot monitoring system, or even a 360 degree camera? Most of those things I would still consider to be optional, but not AEB. That has to be standard right now. I mean, like you said, it's standard on pretty much most other markets. It's as if BMW and Mini specifically ordered these cars without those safety features only for Malaysia. I mean, to rub salt into injury, right? The Asia, which is almost literally 10% or a fraction of what this car costs, comes with AEB. Mm -hmm. Why can't why can't we have it in Mini or you know? And we're not just talking about BMWs and Minis over here. Other brands are just as guilty. We're talking about BMW, Mini, Audi, Jaguar, Land Rover, the lot. I mean Malaysian lives, man. Do we matter? Okay, okay, so let's go beyond all that and get down to the verdict. First, what do you think? 
Well, I think we're going to start by saying that these two cars make zero financial sense whatsoever. I mean, these are very small cars with big sticker prices. But strictly between the two, I have to go with the Clubman JCW. It looks a hell of a lot better than that one. And you know what? It's not as ridiculously priced as the other one compared to the standard car. This is about 60,000 more, whereas that one is about 120, 130,000 more than the Cooper S variant. In fact, any Mini for 380,000 ringgit is a little bit of a tough ask if it's not a Mini JCW GP. But beyond all that, if you ask me personally, I would also swing towards the way of the Clubman, also for the same reasons, because it looks good and I would very much prefer to be seen driving in this thing instead of this. But you know, for those of you who want a plusher ride, this is the way to go. So over to you guys. We've said our piece. What do you guys think? Do you agree or do you disagree with our thoughts and review? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. Thank you for watching. And we will see you in the next one, hopefully yeah. soon, so he can, you know, step out of his car. Maybe not this hot. Yeah, yeah, lose the jacket, <laughs> finally. Oh, thank God, cut, cut.